So first we have uh, Morten Pibulak from, um, sorry, from Massey University, and he will be talking about Documenter.jl. Um, and we're waiting for the thumbs up from AV. We are thumbs up. Okay, go ahead. All right. All right, everything works. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so as uh, Nathan mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Morten. So yeah, I, I'm currently a graduate student at Massey University, but here I'm more, today more like as the, uh, one of the maintainers of the Julia Docs GitHub organization, uh, which collects a bunch of uh, documentation-oriented uh, packages and, and repositories on GitHub. And uh, the, one, the one I want to talk to you about specifically is documenter.jl which if you are a developer of Julia, you may already be quite familiar with. If you have, if you write packages, then it's likely that if you possibly use that to uh, build documentation for your package. But if, if not, then essentially what Documenter.jl does is it tries to make your life as a developer as easy as possible when it comes to creating documentation for your package. Uh, in that, uh, like normally you would want to have like a, some sort of a web page or something that would contain some you know, tutorials, manual, uh, the reference API and stuff like that, but you don't, uh, but yeah, setting it up by hand as, as a website or something is going to be, is, you know, quite a lot of work. And so Documenter tries to automate this, that as much as possible for you. So essentially, um, when you are using Documenter, you need to, uh, it, it, you, you only need to provide two components to Documenter, basically. Um, one of them being the uh, Julie has we already has the feature that you can write documentation inline in code with doc strings, which is essentially these you put these strings in front of your functions or constants or what have you, and they sort of get attached to those objects. And when the Julia parser comes through, those things don't get thrown away, but they actually get stored in uh, Julia actually stores them in a sort of database, and you you can access them later. So the doc strings is the top part there, and the most common. Uh, example of, of where you are accessing that database is when you go to the REPL help mode and you ask for documentation for a particular function, the doc string comes back. It, um, so that's one part. And the second part uh, with Documenter now is you would also want to write sort of just general pages, which might be sort of manual pages or, or tutorials or whatever, which would be just uh, basic markdown documents. Uh, not, nothing fancy. Documenter doesn't use any really any special Markdown syntax, so it's it's just plain Markdown. Um, uh, the only way, the only thing, the way you sort of communicate with Documenter in these documents is using these uh, special code blocks with uh, where the language parameter has this at something. Uh, that, yeah, the language parameters is at docs or at meta or something like that, and those things then Documenter like finds those and knows that oh here I have to do something special with it. Um, so, and you take those together and then Documenter takes over from there basically and can build, build you a manual. So you have, probably, you, you have seen this most likely, so this is just the Julia manual, all the examples to this point were the Julia manual, so the Julia manual itself is built using Documenter, but you can also use it for your own code. And, but yeah, by default Documenter will produce like a nice HTML page. You can see here that the original text is still there, but Documenter has put in the doc string into the uh, into the page onto the page as well, uh, and it will set up other things for you as well, like the source links and the edit on GitHub links and those kinds of things. As I said, it tries to like automate as much as possible. Um, so internally, Documenter actually works by having this sort of pipeline of steps that it like processes the the document that you have in in sort of steps, and the actual the produce the production of the actual output in the form of like a web page or whatever is um, it's just the last step of that, and you can basically replace that and use something else. So Documenter can also produce PDF documents for that. And it's just a matter of replacing the uh, the output stage. Um, so the HTML and, and the PDF are the two sort of main built-in ones that you can use. But in principle, you could also write your own custom one. Um, right. So before I uh, talk about specific features of Documenter, I actually want to give you a, also a quick overview of how you set up Documenter for your own package. So just to show you that it's not super complicated to do that, uh, although it involves a couple of steps. Um, so suppose you have your package um, with you know, all the standard files. You have your project file and, and a couple of uh, markdown files. Uh, 
the Julia source files test and stuff like that, your standard package layout. So to add documentation to your package, you, the only thing you do is you add another subdirectory into your repository, uh, conventionally called docs, and then a couple of things go in there. So first, you want to have it be a another package environment because uh, you're going to have like another set of dependencies here. Well, first of all, you need Documenter itself, obviously, but you may also want to do add some other stuff. For example, if you want to generate some graphs in the manual, then you would also add in like plots.jl or wh whatever. So, so you would have a, have it as a project dependence, uh, like a project environment, and then. In the source directory, you, you just put your these markdown files, possibly some assets as well, if you want to have like a logo or something attached to your manual. Um, and then you have the make.jl script, which uh, you can, which which is actually the script that builds the documentation for you. Now the make.jl script actually will be very, very simple. It can actually be even simpler than that. Um, but uh, and uh, essentially it just you just need documenter and your package and then to call Documenter, you it, it's it's a matter of calling this just single make docs function, and you pass a bunch of bunch of keyboard arguments to make docs, and that's how you configure and and uh, yeah that's how you configure Documenter and uh, yeah customize its output and so on and so forth. Um, so one comment here is that the Essentially, you could you could think that you could replace this make docs with some sort of configuration file because, as I said, it's basic keyword argument. So you could basically reduce down reduce it down to a tom file. Um, but it is a script. But we we are using the script, and I think that it has a couple of benefits because the way I think about the make.jl files, it's it's essentially like a configuration file, but it allows arbitrary Julia code execution, and that's good because you can put some other scriptable stuff in front of the make docs call uh, to generate some of the keyword arguments automatically or something along those lines. So an example of that is in the base manual, uh, if, if you know the layout of the Julia repository itself, you know that the standard library packages, all of them live under like a completely separate uh, uh, directory there. Uh, so when the make.jl script of the, uh, of the base Julia runs, it first has to fetch all of those uh, standard library documentation Files and put them into the main docs folder, so it like a copies them or symlinks them over. Um, so that's the kind of scriptable thing that you may want to uh, may want to have in your uh, before the make docs call. Or the other thing you can do is maybe you are pre-generating the markdown files as well, uh, which uh, Frederick will probably mention that briefly. You can do that, for example, with literate. Is uh, so you're not providing the markdown files; they actually come from somewhere else. There is another think that generates those, and you can just combine them into a single script. So I think there are benefits in having having this as a as a script as opposed to a, a tom file or, or some yeah non scriptable configuration file. Right, um, and then yeah, once you have everything set up, running it is easy. You just run the script, and it will build build it for you. Uh, we'll create uh, another build directory. Uh, and under that, you get all the output that you need. So if it is the default HTML output, it ends up being this sort of static website there uh, with a bunch of HTML files, some JavaScript files, CSS files, and all of those things. If this were a, um, if you had done the PDF output instead, you would just end up with a single PDF file in that directory. All right. All right. So, um, all right. On to, on to features now. Um, so you already saw this, that Documenter can splice doc strings into your manual. Um, so this example comes from Documenter's own manual. Uh, and so the, the basic way you can do it is, yeah, you use this add docs block and explicitly just specify which doc string you want to include in, in your manual. Uh, and the result will look something like this. So it will just list all the doc strings uh, in, their, in, their, in their glory. You, you can't see all of them because they're all long, but uh, they, they, they are there on that page. Um, one thing I, one thing to keep, in, well, yeah, um, you have meth, so if you have functions, um, functions can actually have different methods, and different methods you can have a doc string attached to individual methods. And so in Documenter, if you wanna include, you can actually include specific, well, in, in that case, you would actually include the type signature of the function there as well. And, uh, and then you can just literally cherry pick the, the doc string that you want to include in the manual. 
So this actually I thought it would be a nice tangent to little, talk a little bit about how document, uh, how actually Julia handles doc strings in, in internally. So this is pretty much undocumented as far as I know. Uh, but, and uh, so don't rely on this or uh, anything, but documenter has to think about all of this stuff when it's actually doing, doing uh, like gathering those doc strings and putting them into the manual. So all the doc string handling code lives in this base docs module. Uh, and essentially what it does, the way it's implemented is every module that you have has this special secret variable, which is just a dictionary uh, that contains all the doc strings. So the, uh, the variable name is basically this Jensen variable, so it doesn't clash with anything else, but if you would actually like call names on the module and look at what all the names are, there's gonna be this special meta hash hash four five, four five two or something like that variable somewhere. And that's where all the doc strings live. Uh, the docs, uh, Module provides actually an API so you can access it easily. And you can see that on the right, like I do it uh, for the linear algebra module. And uh, yeah, you see like all, all the bindings that have uh, doc strings attached. Um, so the, the, as I said, it's a dictionary. So it's uh, the keys of that are binding, these docs but bind, binding objects. And uh, essentially, so those identify all the names that live in a module. So every constant or a function or something will, will be a name. And uh, name is just like a string. And then you, you also, in order to uniquely identify each of such object, uh, you also have to keep in mind which module it lives in. So essentially to uniquely identify it, you, you, you consider it to be a, a, a module symbol pair. And binding is just a fancy wrapper around it. Um, so, and on the right side, so as I said, but a single name, for example, if it's a function, function can actually have multiple methods, different methods can have, and each of these methods can have its own doc string. So actually for every binding in general, you have multiple doc strings uh, that can be. So that's why you have the multi-doc object, not the, uh, not the uh, not doc string itself yet. Um, so to walk you through a, a specific uh, example here. So suppose I have a module like this, it has one function in it, and uh, that function has a couple of different sort of methods and it has the doc strings attached. Uh, I can uh, do docs meta on that. You see that, okay, the meta, the meta dictionary has this one, um, one uh, binding there, which is the foo.bar foo function. So I can act just index into the, uh, that dictionary with the binding object. And then uh, I can look at what the multi-doc object actually is, which in itself, well, multi-doc is again like this wrapper, but it does contain this dictionary. And the dictionary are just type strings, uh, well, the keys are type strings, and then the values are the actual doc strings themselves now. So the reason you would use type signatures because, well, most cases we're talking about functions, functions here which have methods, and methods are uniquely identified by the, the types of the positional arguments, which is what you see here. If, for example, the third, third bar function or the th third method there just it's a two argument function with an integer and abstract strings. So it's type signature is just this tuple of int abstract string. And uh, you can just index into that dictionary with that type and get back the doc string. So that's, that's how you can access doc strings. Uh, if you don't have any arguments, if you have a zero argument function, it says empty tuple, that makes sense. Um, the only other thing, only other, other thing is that the uh, some objects like constants or function declarations as opposed to methods uh, or types, for example, don't really have type signatures attached to them. So the fallback uh, answer for uh, in, in the docs module is uh, to use this empty union type to identify those. So, um, so that's why the first one is, is this empty union. So I can just index into, the, into it with the empty union and I get the doc string of the function declaration itself. Um, all right. So to come back to Documenter now again, um, what you so yeah when docu when you provide this at docs block to Documenter, essentially what you're doing is uh, what Documenter has to do is parse each of those lines, go through them, identify what is the binding. Uh, so what uh, yeah what object are you documenting? Which which name? Potentially which method it is? Uh, and also what you have to know. Which I'm actually going to jump back to the previous slide quickly. In the linear algebra module, what you see is that the uh, there are also in this linear algebra module there are also doc strings for functions that are not from the linear algebra module itself, uh, and that's because you can extend your methods 
uh, or you can add methods to functions from outside of the, uh, the current mod module as well. And all of those will, uh, but the doc strings for all of those live in the module that where the doc string or the method is actually defined. So uh, that's something in Documenter also has to keep in mind that, uh, or, or, well, or alternatively that you have to keep in mind when you're including doc strings uh, that, uh, yeah, where is the doc string actually is living as well. And you can kind of configure that in Documenter to make sure you actually get all the doc strings that you want. All right. So, so that's about, uh, so that's doc strings. Another neat feature that document, uh, the docu documenter can do for you uh, is doc testing. So if you have your manual page, uh, you would often write, have basically code examples like this. So it might look something like this. So you have some text and in between you will have these sort of REPL code examples in your manual um, where you would just have like, okay, if the user types in this into the REPL, which is like some function from my package, uh, this is what the output will look like. You just have some, some examples of how you use your, use your code. And that's all fine, and you can just like copy paste those into the manual and just leave them there, no worries. Uh, there is no like code evaluation inherently involved here, like you wouldn't have to do anything fancy. The only problem here is that probably you're, in your next commit you're gonna make some changes to your API, and then you're gonna forget to update the, uh, the manual itself, because like nothing is telling you that the example in the manual is out of date. So Documenter can actually uh, help you with that in that they can check the, uh, that all these code examples are still uh, up to date. So specifically, you would just declare them all to be J these special JL doc test code blocks, and then uh, Documenter will basically just go through all of them, evaluate each of them, and then make sure that the output matches. So again, to show, this, uh, show an example of this, how it would look like, um, so again, suppose you have this sort of module, or let's call it the package here, and uh, you see that it has a function in there, the function has a doc string. What you see is that this doc string though is out of date because it's, it, that, sorry, the, the doc test is out of date because yeah, it says hi stranger, but it will, should actually output hello stranger. Um, so what you can do is in Documenter you have this doc test function and you can call that on your package and it will go through all your manual pages and then all the doc strings in your uh, in your package and uh, make sure and will check if the inputs and outputs match and you see here that it will start yelling at you that okay this uh, the output doesn't match just could comment here like uh, in in the terminal this is actually in color including the diff so it's the diff is actually more helpful in the terminal um, right so one other thing you may see here is that this doc test function is a test set itself. And that is intentional because you, this allows the doc test function to, I guess, doc testing step to be included actually in your own, uh, like run test JL script in your unit, unit test setup. Um, so, and yeah, it will integrate nicely and show up like, well, mm -hmm. at the moment it will show up that like one doc test failed or, or doc testing, doc testing is like a single test at the moment in, in that sense. So if any doc tests fail, it will report like one failure. Uh, hopefully we can like update that in the future. Uh, but yeah, so there is a, there is a way to, to incorporate into the, uh, into tests. So that's actually, if you're, if you are already a long time user of Documenter, this is actually a new feature that got tagged last week. So uh, get it while it's hot. Um, all right. So, uh, so maybe as yeah, as just for completeness, I quickly want to mention the sort of last largest fe larger feature that Documenter has, which involves just arbitrary code evaluation, which is this sort of uh, weave or Jupyter type thing going on. So basically, you can just write arbitrary Julia code in this, for example, at the, in this add example box, and uh, Documenter will come will evaluate all of that, and the last object object gets uh, sort of dumped into the manual or sh shown the, some representation of it gets shown in the manual. So this is nice if you wanna, uh, yeah, just like run your code and show the users what happens when they run it, or if you wanna include some graphs and that kind of stuff. There are a few ways you can um, actually uh, do this, like they're like sort of formatted, but I'm not gonna go through all of them. I will mention though, uh, like Weave and uh, Weave and Jupyter, uh, documenting can also handle uh, mimes, mime types nicely. So if you do have an object 
uh, that can um, can be shown in a more complicated mime, like an image PNG or just even text HTML. Documenter will come in and uh, recognize that, and will instead of just showing the text representation, will actually show the image or or just put the raw HTML into the uh, into the output. So this one, this example, yeah, uses uh, just a example from the one of the sort of hello world examples from Luxor, the drawing object that you have in Luxor uh, can be shown. I'm guessing it, this is like image SVG uh, MIME that it uh, uses. And uh, yeah, instead of just showing some text uh, representation of it, it actually puts the actual image into the manual. So that's, that's neat. All right, so, so those are all the, all the features that uh, I wanted to cover. There are a few others in the uh, in documenter as well. I would recommend that you go and read the manual. There, it's uh, fairly well documented what documenter can do for you. It can also, uh, <laughs> which would be ironic if it weren't. And, um, uh, but for example, it can also generate like table, tables of contents and it manages cross references between pages and does that kinds of stuff. Um, Right, so a little bit about the future. Uh, so I'm currently also a Google Summer of Code student, so I'm putting a little bit more time into actually developing Documenter. Uh, and one of the sort of the main uh, things that I'm working on um, with uh, is sort of upgrading the HTML front end. So if you've used the Julia manual, then you know what, what kind of HTML or what kind of a front end it outputs. So I've, I've been trying to update it. Uh, and here would be a demo of what the new one looks like. Still work, very much work in progress, but you can see it's like it's probably the same. It's not like a massive, uh, like from a user perspective, it's not massively different, uh, but I have tried to like fix up all kinds of small details about it. So for example, you can do now, yeah, collapsible submenus, which I think as I've been like just playing around with this demo myself, I, I really, uh, where's my mouse? Here it is. So, yep, so you can now click them and they will expand, um, which is, for example, useful for this developer documentation, which has a couple of layers to it as well. Uh, another thing you can do now is go and have sort of theme support, and there might be a dark theme coming for the manual. Now, if I could just get to the, so, yeah, here it is. So this is very much still work in progress. You may see a couple of things that are not properly themed yet and so, so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's what I've been working on over the past like month and a half now with, uh, within the Google Summer Code thing. Uh, I'll just mention, I'll just mention, so as I said, the front end is not that much different actually in some ways. But in the back end, it's quite a bit different. So instead of previously, uh, the HTML page was basically just a, there was this single CSS file that themed the whole thing. Uh, now I've switched over to, and that was a custom, custom written CSS file. So now I've actually switched it over to a CSS framework. And it, instead of using just the raw CSS, it's actually built with SAS uh, files. So uh, that will hopefully make theming easier for people who wanna like customize their own, the looks of their own manual. Hopefully that process will, will be easier because instead of having to like write your own CSS, you can just, for simpler things, you can just provide, uh, like override a couple of variables like what the background color of the sidebar is or something like that. And then, um, I right, actually can show you. Um, so you can, yeah, overload just a couple of variables and it will uh, up, like, and then compile a theme and, and ship it with your manual and it will look the way you want. It should, it should make it easier to maintain that theme for you. Um, yeah, so like these things you wouldn't normally touch in the theme file and then you just provide a couple of overloads. So this one is the dark theme, so it's a little bit complicated. There's actually a lot of stuff going on in the variable CSS include, but oh well. Um, and another thing I, I, I wanna work on is currently adding in like additional JavaScript dependencies to the documentation is a little bit hard. Like Documenter doesn't really have a way of adding in additional C, uh, yeah, JavaScript libraries or something to the resulting HTML. I want to put, create some APIs, so that would be much easier to do as well. Um, all right, so that's basically it. I just want to mention a couple of people. So most of the stuff that you've seen here uh, is uh, like 
I'm not the original author of the package. Uh, this was created by Michael Hatherley. Um, much of the stuff that you see here is his work, actually. Um, I also want to mention uh, Frederick because uh, he's done a lot of uh, good work on uh, implementing some features and uh, and helped out a lot with the maintenance. So thank you very much for that. And like every, and other a lot of other people have been uh, like making these sort of one-off pull requests and that that kind of stuff. So that's that's also much appreciated. So I think with that, uh, thank you very much for listening. Hi, I'm wondering how you generate your HTML. Like, are you using a templating engine? And if so, can I have it yesterday? <laughs> like, Sorry, what was the last part? If so, can I have it yesterday? <laughs> uh, so, no, not quite. So, no, it's more or less, Documenter has this uh, HTML DSL thingy. It has this one small module which you can look up, which allows you to pretty easily sort of write just Julia objects uh, that are actually, and they form this HTML uh, DOM tree basically, and then it can print it all out for you. But in that sense, it's all done in the Julia code okay. as sort of like, okay, I'm gonna put now like an A tag and a P tag, and uh, then that goes into a div and that kind of stuff, and has that class on it and stuff like that. So there is no templating engine as, as in like in most static sites generators and such. Is it, is it fit for like public consumption? This module? Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah. Yeah, okay. like it hasn't changed. It's it's doing its job well. So could consider making it a package or something as well. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I had a few questions. I've been trying to use this to, to write a book. Um, so, one of my problems I see when I use this uh, at example um, is if you create your own types and so on, they, they show up their names as example underscore like these long type names that doesn't look so good in the, as code examples. Um, okay. Is there any thoughts about around fixing that or recommendations of how you get around that? Um, not off the top of my head, uh, so we can talk about it more later. Yeah. In short, I will just mention, uh, actually this is an interesting detail, all this code evaluation, Documenter will create a new module for it and mm -hmm. like it all happens in that module. And then can and that means it actually does have to like kind of do some workarounds with this sort of printing stuff because like it actually is evaluated maybe in a sub module and so uh, it will show up with some prefix and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think I also remember for a similar issue there is actually an issue in base Julia for that uh, that's related. But yeah, I don't have a good good answer right right now. Yeah. So just a, two other questions. Uh, is there, a, uh, have you thought about having any way of highlighting a line of code, for instance? Like I the, haven't uh, thought about it, but it's, yeah, it could be done, I think. If, uh, yeah, it would probably have to be like an, um, so you mean for one of the, so yeah, for, just for a code example box. Yeah, so your code example and uh, it would be nice to have maybe line numbers and a highlight if you want to refer to it in the text. Yeah, line numbers, I actually have thought about it, just having okay. like line numbers inside or that is something you can toggle. Um, so someone would have to implement it, but uh, we could have like, actually some of those blocks take sort of uh, keyword arguments themselves, so you can like customize them a little bit and these kinds of things could live there as keyword arguments and then that will change the output a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. final question. Uh, I was very uh, interested in being able to produce like an EPUB uh, format, is mm -hmm. there, any way to, uh, you can recommend for doing that, or is this going to come down the road, or no plans at all? Uh, there is an open issue for that. Uh, there is. I don't have any plans on implementing it myself at the moment, but in principle, as I said, like it's just a matter of creating a new writer module. Uh, ideally, that would live as a package. Uh, so yeah, again, someone would have to implement it, but it, it is doable. It wouldn't be that hard because you can basically just take the final representation of the document the documenter has and then you just have to write something that prints out the necessary uh, XML, I guess, is for EPUB or whatever the exact format is. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, 
The main difficulty I've had with Documenter is linking to like version specific binaries on the website, like a PDF or something like this, and a GitHub release. Um, so the way we got around this was just having some text with like the Travis tag that we then substitute in inside the make.jl. But is there like any support for this or any better way that you could think of or? Uh, so no, currently, yeah, there is okay. no, no support for doing that. So yeah, you would have to just rely on some environment. Like this there kind of hack type, yeah. yeah. There is actually sort of a, yeah, that's, that's a small annoyance with the way that the, um, it's currently built because basically you have to call this make docs and it produces the HTML file. But then there is actually this another function which helps you with when you want to deploy to Travis, which is called deploy docs, and it kind of does it automatically for you. But it only just you know copy pastes all the uh, HTML files that are already generated, and all the information about versions and stuff is in deploy docs, so right. that that doesn't go back into the HTML. So there is like uh, ideally, I would actually like to uh, work on that a little bit so that you would already have that version information, for example, when you're basically calling make docs. Thanks. Oh, so you you showed an example of uh, docs.meta that had a multi-docs dictionary yep. uh, that had the, the type information of each function in there as the keys. Uh, yep. Um, is it, so what happens when you have uh, default arguments or keyword arguments? And, uh, it, and is it possible to hook into the generation of the docs in order to update the docs with that information? Uh, so no. Uh, because keyword arguments don't distinguish the different methods. Uh, only the position arguments matter, so the keyword arguments never get stored. Like, uh, you can do another thing. I think you can get, for a particular function, you can probably fetch the information about keyword arguments if you want to like display it somehow. Uh, and I think docstring extensions, for example, does that. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to actually storing docstrings, then just the keyword arguments, they don't matter at all, so they're not stored, so they don't come in play here. 